Hey, what's up? I got a confession to make. So my confession is this. About a month ago, I was debating whether I should sit the DevOps Pro exam or not at that time. And I'd done about three weeks of study, but I didn't quite feel ready for it. So I actually decided that I would give it another month. And that's not really the confession. The confession is the reason I was not so certain about it is because I was scared. I had set a precedent of getting 900 plus on a bunch of exams. Admittedly, I didn't do it for security specialty, but Solutions Architect Pro, Machine Learning specialty, and I really wanted to do the same thing on DevOps Pro, and I didn't think I'd be able to do it. So it took me another month of really just taking a break and letting all the lessons and, and all the things I had been practicing sink in a bit more. And then I spent another week just going back over the course and I'm happy to say that last week I took the DevOps Pro exam and it was actually my best score on an AWS exam yet. Now, score's not everything, obviously, but it is a big deal to me and I'm really happy that I managed to do well on that exam. And I think it goes to show as well that the focus on experience and actually learning the, the tools and technologies that are getting tested rather than just trying to cram for the exam is a strategy that pays off really well long-term. So I really wanna share with you guys in this video the way that I kind of approach the exam and that's worked out really well for me and uh, just give a bunch of tips and advice. I sort of make this, these videos thinking in mind of someone on LinkedIn, for example, who might message me asking, hey, how did you pass the DevOps Pro exam? Tell me everything you know. And that's pretty much what this video is for. So I want you guys to leave this video knowing exactly the path you need to take in order to become not just a certified DevOps engineer in the sense that you pass the exam, but actually a DevOps engineer in the sense that you understand DevOps technology. So I obviously can't teach you all of that in this video, but I can point you towards how I learned and give you some advice for maybe potential pitfalls along the way and uh, tips as well as to little things I picked up that can be helpful. So let's get into it. So first things first, what is DevOps? It's a word that gets thrown around a lot. It's a bit of a buzzword, you know, blockchain and machine learning and so on. And I think a lot of people outside the industry don't really know what it is. And even people inside the industry are kind of getting a bit confused about it because it is a pretty subtle distinction that you have to make. So if we think about where the word comes from DevOps, it's development and operations together. So traditionally you'd have a development team and an operations team. The development team builds an application and the operations team deploys it and handles the infrastructure and so on. And mainly thanks to the cloud, we're now able to have kind of those, both of those teams rolled into one. So this can manifest itself in a number of ways. And in a smaller company, it might mean something like you have a DevOps guy or a DevOps girl. And what that means is he or she will be the person responsible for in a sense, managing that company's infrastructure, but also has acts as a developer in a way, and especially around the things that connect the two together. So there's a number of places where the code has to come from the developer's computers and somehow get deployed. And so that's a big part of DevOps. But then we also have to sort of manage the monitoring and logging and so on, so the more operations side of it, but then also more of the development side, so infrastructure as code and things like that. So it's a bit of a nebulous term, but uh, DevOps is a really interesting area and you're bound to come across it if you're either a developer or really anything that is related to the cloud, you're, you're gonna run into DevOps at some point and uh, you should learn about it. So that's kind of the motivation for where DevOps comes from and where it fits into a company. But more specifically, there's a bunch of skills that are widely considered as DevOps skills. And that's kind of what you get, get tested on in the exam. So that includes things like CICD, which is short for constant integration, constant delivery, and sometimes constant deployment, uh, which is essentially how do we get code off of someone, someone's laptop and deployed into the, into the servers, into the cloud. And then on top of that, there's um, build pipelines and deployment systems, different deployment strategies. So we've got rolling deployments, blue-green deployments, all at once in place, that kind of thing. We have sort of different deployment philosophies, like how are we running this application? Are we gonna use containers? Are we gonna use virtual machines? Are we gonna use a serverless architecture? 
And DevOps engineers need to have a good understanding of all of that and be able to implement solutions using that. So speaking kind of spe specifically about AWS, what AWS wants you to know is they have this whole suite of tools they call the code suite. And that's often written as code asterisk. And so that includes code build, code deploy, and code pipeline. And also sometimes people will say it includes a thing called code star, which you don't need to worry too much about. But basically code pipeline allows you to set up a whole pipeline where you have starting at one stage, which might be for example, a GitHub repository, someone commits code, then the pipeline will send to the next stage, which might be a build stage. And then the next stage is a test stage and then a deploy stage. You might deploy to different environments, different regions, even different AWS accounts and so on. And so code pipeline orchestrates all that. And then code build and code deploy sit within that pipeline to either manage building your code uh, into, a, into a runnable application or testing it or deploying it to servers. There's also Lambda plays a big part in this exam. So you wanna know about serverless application models, so SAM, and you also wanna know about uh, containers. So ECS, Elastic Container Service, plays a big part. And Elastic Beanstalk, unfortunately, <laughs> played quite a big part in my exam at least. Um, I say unfortunately because I actually, to be honest, have very little experience with Elastic Beanstalk. It's not something that's really interested me because it seems to solve problems that exist when you don't know how the rest of AWS works together or if you want a really quick solution to something that's maybe less customizable or less, uh, it's kind of out of the box for you. So they, they handle your database potentially and your load balancing and your auto scale and everything for you. Um, whereas, you know, obviously you can do that manually in AWS. Um, so personally, I found myself really hesitating to learn Elastic Beanstalk, but you need to kind of be aware of it and how it works. Obviously, it didn't make too much of a difference um, from a from a mark standpoint. Like I knew the broad aspects of Elastic Beanstalk, when you would use it and how it could fit into your system. And so for that reason, I think I did all right on that bit. But yeah, personally, I wasn't a huge fan of that area, but it came up a whole lot in this exam. Another one was OpsWorks. So there was a few questions on that and I haven't used that. I'm not too familiar with Chef. I have done a little bit of playing around with it just for the sake of understanding it for the exam, but I haven't used it in any production projects. And it really showed because those were the exam the questions I struggled with. So OpsWorks, Elastic Beanstalk, Lambda's another one, but personally I have used plenty of Lambda, so that helped a lot. Um, if you haven't, definitely try deploying your own Lambda functions. Follow my serverless framework tutorial as well, because that will teach you how to write code on your machine that then gets deployed to the cloud serverlessly. And uh, there's also serverless application model is something that's AWS's version of serverless framework, basically. Cloud formation plays a big role. So infrastructure as code is this whole section on the exam. And you really need to know that to a pretty good level. So that's including things like CFN hub and CFN init, which is how do you make cloud formation cause updates on your EC2 instances, for example. It's a pretty advanced concept. Uh, then we also have things like custom resources. When would you use them? You don't really need to be able to write them, but uh, you need to be able to read CloudFormation and understand what it's saying. Um, and things about like IAM policies with CloudFormation, when would you use uh, capability IAM versus capability IAM named or capability named IAM, sorry. And other things like capability auto expand. If none of this makes sense to you, don't really worry, but you would need to know it going to the exam. Um, but I will give you a list of resources you can use that will get you up to date on all of this. So at this point, I'm just naming things that you might need to know, but um, if you follow these, then then you'll get there. So the, the resources that I use um, for DevOps, there's unfortunately no Adrian Cantrell course at this point. And Adrian Cantrell is an instructor who I have recommended to everybody um, pretty much to the point where some people have actually asked me, is he paying you? <laughs> but he's not. Um, he's just a really, really, really good instructor. I recommend him to anyone trying to learn AWS, but he has the AWS uh, Solutions Architect Associate and Pro courses. So if you're doing those, go with Adrian Cantrell, learn.cantrell.io. I'll put that in the description. And if you're doing DevOps, unfortunately, he's not there, but there is Stefan Marek, who's another really great instructor. So I'll put the link to Stefan's courses in the description as well. That's the one I followed. Um, the second one as well that I used, which was by Zeal Vora, uh, which is another course on Udemy. So both Stefan and Zeal's courses were on Udemy. I like Zeal's 
teaching style. He's very kind of laid back and he also focuses around a bunch of demos that the other instructors don't really think to cover. So I like that. And uh, I'm glad that I followed a bit of the zeal, a bit of the zeal course, but I only, to be honest, went through maybe a quarter of it because uh, I felt pretty ready by the end of, of Stefan's course. I just wanted a little bit extra. Um, so yeah, that's mostly the resources I use. There is one big other thing, which was the tutorials, dojo practice exams. And I use these for any exam that they cover um, because they have really, really high quality practice exams comparable to the real exam. Um, and I actually found with this one that a lot of the questions on the actual exam that I got were very similar to the questions on the practice exam. Now I'm not suggesting that Tutorials Dojo has actually taken questions from the AWS exam. Um, it more comes from the fact that the knowledge of the people who put these exams together is so close with the actual things that are being tested that um, the types of questions you get are going to completely prepare you for the actual exam in a really, really strong way. So I, I recommend those uh, to everybody as well. So all up, if you count these together and you get the proper discounts on the courses from the links I've, I'll share you, um, that ends up being really cheap. It's about $20, let's, let's go US dollars, about 20 US dollars for the practice exams and another 15 US dollars for the um, the course. So that's really cheap in comparison to the actual exam, which is like 300 US. So um, all up, these resources are not expensive and they're definitely worth it. You spend about 20 hours uh, going through Stefan's course and you will be ready to sit, sit the exam if you understand everything. Um, now, obviously I'm coming from a background of, I have previously had seven AWS certifications. So if this is your first exam, I would re not recommend going for DevOps Pro. Um, in terms of the path, I'd say start with the developer associate or solutions architect associate, um, and then get sysops associate. And once you've got developer and sysops, then you'd be ready to go for DevOps. A lot of people like to do all three of the associates before they start in the professionals, and I'd recommend that generally. Um, I think DevOps professional is a lot easier than solutions architect professional. So if I could do this again, maybe I would do DevOps first. But on the other hand, I kind of liked how this professional exam was actually comparatively pretty manageable. It was definitely not as bad as the solutions architect professional exam. And I, I found that I was exhausted after doing solutions architect professional, but that wasn't so much the case after doing the DevOps pro. Anyway, that's a bit of a brain dump for you. So hopefully that covers really everything that is important to know going into this exam, but that's how you prepare from the AWS standpoint and sort of the services that you'd need to cover. And more broadly speaking, if you want to become a DevOps engineer, there's a really good roadmap on roadmap.sh, which I'll share the link as well. And that provides a lot of info about some of the other services that are really widely used. So I mentioned the Elastic Container Service, which runs on Docker in a way. So you've got uh, Docker containers running in your VMs in the cloud. And there's another service, there's another system that does the same thing called Kubernetes, which you, you may or may not have heard of. And it's kind of more industry standard. So AWS has their own thing, it's a lot simpler. You can run Kubernetes on AWS though. And uh, Kubernetes is considered one of those like big DevOps things. So if you wanna you know, go and get a DevOps job, uh, knowing Kubernetes, knowing Docker, maybe something like Ansible, Terraform as well. So Terraform is kind of like cloud formation, but generalized not just to AWS, so it works on other cloud providers as well. Um, those are some of the tools that you might want to look at. And um, there's plenty of resources for how you can go about learning those. And the other thing as well is, I was talking about the code suite, so code build, code deploy, code pipeline. There's plenty of tools out there, generally known as CICD. It's really its whole industry. You've got CircleCI, you've got GitHub, you've got GitLab, um, you've got Jenkins, and really too many to name in terms of providers for this. Personally, I've used GitLab CI and CircleCI before learning code build, and the skills are extremely transferable. So if you learn one, then you're, I'd say probably halfway towards learning, learning the other. The fundamentals are all really pretty much the same between all of them, but you're gonna have specific differences in terms of the, conf, the types of config files that you're writing and so on. Anyway, so that's a bit of a ramble, but uh, hopefully that information has been really valuable. Please leave a comment and let me know if you have any questions. I'm always happy to answer and I'll try to get back to everybody. Um, other than that, hope you liked the video and good luck with the DevOps exam if that's what you wanna sit. Do send me a message if you, uh, 
pass it or if you don't pass it or if you're about to go for it, just let me know. Uh, you can add me on LinkedIn as well. Once again, I'll put that link in the description. Finally, give this video a like if you liked it and subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more like this and have a great day, guys.